what will happen is that maybe we start doing something when we're in the when you're 20 or when you're 30 and we'll have this treatment where it will rejuvenate you know your systems and you will age maybe but age much much uh, slower aging none of us can escape like gravity it pulls on each of us why do some of us age gracefully and others don't how do our bodies and minds experience aging at a cellular and molecular level? Why do we even age to begin with? And maybe most importantly, can we do anything about it? My name is Gordon Lithgow, and here at the Buck Institute in California, my colleagues and I are searching for and actually finding answers to these questions and many more. On this podcast, we discuss and discover the future of aging with some of the brightest scientific stars on the planet. We're not getting any younger, yet. Hi everyone, welcome to the show. I'm so delighted to have Nir Barzilai today on our show. It's a tremendous pleasure to have a chance to talk to this trained physician who's really at the forefront of bringing interventions in the biology of aging into the human domain through clinical trials. Nir, welcome to our podcast. It's, it's a real privilege. Uh, you're such a thoughtful and a deep thinker about aging, especially human aging and exceptional longevity. And, you know, your, your leadership is really obvious to all of us in the field. So, so f first of all, uh, flattery will get you nowhere. I, I'm still happy to, to talk with you. And I think you'll be forever in many minds be this pioneer who called us, who called the field geroscience and, and uh, made us really geroscientists, which is lots of advantages. One of them is that we have to distinct ourselves from anti-aging, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and that's a good way to, to do it. So thank you for your contribution and your leadership and your thoughtfulness. So Nir, when we first met, we were reviewing grants together. And I was stunned at how detail-oriented you were and analytical as you dissected uh, these grant applications. But obviously, you're also a, a, a big thinker, big picture person. So I guess my first question is the big picture question. What do you think the major challenges are in the field right now? For me, there are three challenges. One is how can we delay our aging now? I call it the Dorian Gray effect. Dorian Gray stopped aging when he looked, when he looked at, uh, at himself in the mirror, he knew that he's aging. And by the way, that's what happened to me in Zoom time. Okay, I'm looking at myself and I'm saying, okay, I'm aging in Zoom, but I'm actually much younger, okay? <laughs> but how to do it? That's one challenge. The second challenge is what we call the Wolverine or, or maybe the Fountain of Youth. Take an old person, and put him in a pool and he goes up young. And I want to tell you, this is the biggest challenge that we have. Although, clearly, in animals, we can take old animals and make them healthier. Even if we don't extend their life by much, we can make them earlier. But I think the biggest promise, and I think what will happen, it's only 50 years away, but what will happen is that maybe we start doing something when we're in the when you're 20 or when you're 30 and you'll come once a month or one a year and we'll have this treatment where it will rejuvenate, you know, your systems and you will age maybe, but age much, much uh, slower. And I think in each level of those, we have a story and we have a promise, okay? One of the things that excites me most from this perspective, not from the science perspective, because always science excites me more. But from this perspective is the promise of TAME study that will be launched soon. I hope it's been delayed, but the funding is looks like it's there. But the TAME study is going to demonstrate that we can do kind of a Dorian Gray. We can maybe delay aging and therefore delay age-related diseases, a cluster of them, significantly. But the major reason I'm doing that is to get an FDA indication that will allow aging to be a preventable situation. 
I definitely want to talk a lot about the TAME study and in, in, in some detail. Yeah, I want to say for the other two, one of those um, Wolverine Fountain of Youth seems to be we, we can do good things, uh, at least proven in animals, for uh, senescent yeah. cells. Okay, I think removing yeah. cells is of benefit, and there are lots of studies now. I, I don't think we know that it works in humans, but I'll be surprised if it's not working yes. in humans. It's a question of yes. how to do it. And of course, the third thing is something that we are thinking as a moonshot, but those moonshots, unlike sending somebody to the moon, I, I think have a, a different time scale to them. And this idea of taking Yamamoto factors or something and rejuvenating and erasing the epigenome and maybe doing some other things to secure yeah. uh, the healthy work of the cells and organs and body is something that it can everything can go in parallel. Yeah, super exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that... I share your excitement about the field right now and all these possibilities, but I want to go back, actually. I just want to know how you became a scientist. Maybe you could talk about the schoolboy near Barzilai and, and when you started to think about science and medicine. Yeah, you know, it, it was weird for me because when I was 13, I walked with my grandfather every Saturday. We had this walk. And he would tell me what he did when he was young, which was quite uh -huh. incredible. Uh -huh. But I'm looking at a 68-year-old man who, by the way, died when he was 68, mm. uh, who was fat and slow and bald and not energetic. And, and I, I know that most of us do not think that we're going to look like our grandparents. Mm -hmm. They think that the grandparents got, you know, who knows where they're from? We have no idea, but that's not us. And, and for me, it's something that I couldn't leave. Not only that, I was in Israel, then I went to the army, I became a medic. I wanted to be in the medical profession. I, I went to a really great uh, medical school. My mentors were Nobel Prize laureates. I, I went to the best internship and resident, mm -hmm. but all the time... It was kind of interesting. Everybody was, let's see the cholesterol level. Let's see the blood pressure. And I'm looking and I'm saying, just a minute, there's something you can get right now that has nothing to do with these measurements. You can see it, who's old and who's young. You know that it's the old that are getting to a problem. So why are they old? Yeah. And do they have to be old? So you really came into medicine because of this observation about aging? I, I came to medicine because I wanted to be a doctor, because my father yeah. and grandfather were a doctor. But the thing of aging was the most curious thing for me. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. I thought that endocrinology maybe can explain a lot of aging. Maybe if you just replace all those hormones, you'll be young again. And so my formal training was in endocrinology and metabolism. Let's get into your science now. You're very well known for your incredible... Um, uh, productivity around exceptional longevity and this this very rare group of humans that seem to be doing something right that maybe the rest of us are not doing but 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 genetics is is at the heart of your studies and um, I want to start by asking and this is my profound ignorance near but it you know we read recently that that from a calico study that the variation in human lifespan you know short-lived long-lived the variation in the human lifespan, only like 7% of that variation is accounted for by ge genetics. First of all, do you believe that? And then secondly, I want to connect that to your, to your work on exceptional longevity. And is there a contrast between those two things? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So look, I think, I think the, the efforts, mainly of demographers, to kind of figure out how much is a genetic and how much environment is a little bit funny even in their minds because in their minds, okay, 80% goes to this side of the room and 20% to this side of the room when we know that it's the interaction between the environment and genetics are important. Mm -hmm. let, let me say it in a different way. Let's say 7% is genetic. If we find what are those 7%, couldn't we design a drug that will protect us against the 
other percentage. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. The second thing is some, some of those studies, I'll give two examples. Some of the studies look at the correlation between lifespan of parents and their kids, okay? So my, yeah. gran gra my grandfather, I mentioned, he died from heart attack at the age of 68. My mm -hmm. father also got a heart attack at the age of 68, and he got a stent and triple bypass, and he died at 84. So the lifespan mm, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't seem to match, but obviously they got the same disease at the same age, okay? So mm -hmm. the genetic was actually part of it. And the genetic mm. was of hyperlipidemia, which I have, and I'm, I've been treating it for uh, all my life. So I hope, I hope mm. to prevent it. Um, another example is from uh, identical twins, okay? Yes. Identical yeah. twins have 25% genetic contribution to their longevity. It's a bit more than 7%, but it's still, it's still not that uh, convincing. But this is the yeah. problem. I've, I've studied this phenomenon with uh, intrauterine ligation where we get pups to be small for, for their gestational age and they get- This is, this is mice near or rats? This is, this is rats actually. This mm -hmm. is rats. And they get age-related diseases. I mean, amazingly, a animals don't get diabetes usually. You really have to try hard. And they get hmm. diabetes when they're three and a half months. It's, there is a hypothesis, a Barker hypothesis. It came from a, a, an unfortunate experiment in World War II where yeah. people had famine and, and they were born small and they got into lots of trouble young, younger on diabetes, hypertension. So... Yeah. Identical twins, a lot of them are born not symmetrical, but one of them is small for gestational age. And if they're less than five pounds, and a lot of identical twins are less than five pounds, they get an aging mechanism that we think is epigenetic that doesn't reflect the rest of us. So I, I don't think this is mm. a real good model. But I would say it now from the opposite side. In our centenarians, it looks like that it's more 80% genetics and 20% the environment. In fact, uh -huh. from an okay. environmental perspective, where 60% of the men were smokers, 30% of the women were smokers, um, overweight or obesity, more than 50% of them uh, exercising even modestly, you know, just walking. Yeah, yeah less than 50%, vegetarian 2%. So, so for our centenarians, it's clearly more genetics. And, and lastly, our offspring of centenarians, were, which are part of longitudinal study, uh -huh. we, we had the paper that kind of really nails it because we have all the data on the offspring and our control environment. We knew what food and what proportion of food they are eating and how much alcohol and how much cigarette they are smoking and the micro and the micronutrients and their BMI and everything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And between the two groups, they were totally identical, totally identical. However, their cardiovascular disease prevalence was almost half as low. Yeah. So yeah, you yeah. almost match the environment at a very at an age where it counts, not in centenarians, but when they are 65 to 75. Mm -hmm. And still <laughs> you see that the genetics plays a protective role because they get half of their heart attacks. And by the way, it's true for Alzheimer's for, for other things that we're monitoring. So this is one really important contribution you've made is to be studying the, the children of the super centenarians and centenarians. Just before we get into that, how many people make it to 100? What proportion of the population? Oh, um, it, it's actually hard to know. It depends what method you do. But when I started, it was considered that one out of 10,000 is mm -hmm. 100 years old. And that there are more of those because they are a little bit bionic. There's more people with, uh, you know, pacemakers and artificial sure. limbs and stuff uh, like sure. that. But, you know, we uh, try to look at that through the vote, voter registry. 
um, in the Bronx, where Einstein is, mm -hmm. and we found that the ratio of centenarians is one to thousand until we realize that we have like 100 people over the age of 150 and uh, 2,000 over the, over the age of 130. In other words, <laughs> uh, In other words yeah. you know, we have to know that there are voters out there mm -hmm. that are using <laughs> some other instruments, but it's really hard to know and to even validate the real mm -hmm. age. But I would I say see. one out of the, I would say it's rare. It's from genetic perspective, it's rare enough yeah, and then super centenarians over 110, uh, again, does that must drop off to a remarkably small number. A huge drop off. I mean, look, um, even in centenarian, you lose 30% each year, okay? So, mm. uh, you know, you, wow. your, your chances of being uh, that, that is really uh, not, so not so high. So, so for the non-geneticists out there, um, just describe how you, how you, how do you find genes that are associated with longevity or exceptional longevity uh, using this structure that you've used this control group of younger individuals or children? Just unpack that a little bit for us. Right. Let, let, let me just say, let, let me before that just say another thing, because I want to eliminate some other possibilities for their longevity. I kind of told you from the environment perspective, they haven't really reacted <laughs> like, like yeah. that's not the reason. In fact, in our paper, we have control of their cohort. OK, the, that's called Enhance One. And we see that they're a little worse than their cohort even. So mm. that's not that. Mm. The second question for us is, you know, we know that there are genes for Alzheimer and cardiovascular disease and cancer. Maybe our centenarians just have the perfect genome, I call it. You know, they just don't have mm -hmm. any of that nonsense. So the first experiment we did, which is just cool and easy to explain, we had 44 centenarians uh -huh. that we had the whole genome sequence. Okay, no control, no young control, no, just them. But okay. there is a, a resource that's called ClinVar. ClinVar accumulate all the mutations that are associated with diseases, and we wanted to have those that are most probably causing disease. And, and we said, you know, at least we'll see. If they don't have any of those mutations, they have pretty good genome. We were not ready to the fact that 44 centenarians had over 130 mutations that should have made them sick. Uh -huh. And wow. among them, as an example, are two people who have, two men who had APOE4 mutation. And mm -hmm. the textbook will tell you they are demented at 70 and dead at 80. And they're 100 years old and not demented. Mm, incredible. Which kind of shows that if they if they uh, have slow aging, they can escape some of those diseases. And of course, Alzheimer, you can born with APOE4. You're not demented when you're born aware you're a 10-year-old or 40-year-old. It takes you, it takes the biology of aging to bring this disease out. Yeah. So if you can yeah. if you can escape it long enough, you even don't get this this disease. So I just wanted to take off the environment and the perfect genome out of the equation now to tell you and i think i think we've done this this gene you know the fact that we that the genome was sequenced was such a breakthrough and it's very important but then we did something really silly what we did is we took one mutation at a time and one disease at a time and we said are they correlated let's look at one wrong sequence for diabetes okay and let's yeah. see in the old people, all people in the world, let's take 100,000 people and see if there is a connection. When in fact, we're not built of one change at a time. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. built from mm -hmm. many changes in, 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 at a time. Some of them are upstream and some of them are downstream and the, the, the biology is complex. And, and although we use this to find significant findings, what we are doing now is actually uh, finding all the differences between long-lived individual and those without longevity. Okay, so they're younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unrelated. Okay, that's not mm -hmm. the offspring. Are unrelated, 
But what we're doing with a computational, with AI, is putting them into pathways. And then we're asking, what are the difference in the pathways between yeah. those, those with longevity and those without? And the interesting thing is we're getting what we got from animals all along. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. IGF insulin signaling pathway, mTOR pathway, um, you know, MEP kinase pathway. In other words, we when we do it this way, we get confirmation that the, the models you're studying, Gordon, are, as we claim, <laughs> that aging is conserved, that e even the longevity part is really conserved. And I think that's one very important contribution to remember that we're we're relevant in all our models. Isn't this amazing? Like I I can't I can't believe really we're we're, we're having this conversation. And in, in when I started working on C. elegans, a tiny little microscopic nematode, I never thought we'd have anything you know, significant to say about human aging. And I actually, when your your longevity gene project, isn't it like twenty four years ago it started? Yeah, in ninety eight exactly. So in in ninety eight, what was your thought processes? So you're you're I guess you're reading some of these papers from from worm people and fly people. Maybe you're going to conferences at that time, talking to them. I mean, did did you really foresee that the the stuff that they were doing would be relevant to to your thinking about human aging? So let, let me tell you a funny story. Gary Rufkin, Cynthia Canyon, right, had their papers, and it it was fabulous. The concept that one gene changed lifespan was just just the most fabulous thing. But for me, it was the wrong, the wrong gene. It was the insulin signaling pathway. And yeah. I'm, I'm an endocrinologist. I'm actually a diabetologist. I'm seeing patients a couple of times a month, okay? And the problem with type 2 diabetes, they're insulin resistant, which what, 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 what the nematodes were pretty much. Yeah. And, and not only that, they're insulin resistant where the in patients, their main problem, they have abdominal obesity, they have lots of intra visceral fat, and the nematodes that fed in their intestines too. Yeah. And I remember organizing this symposium in the American Diabetes Association meeting and bringing Cynthia Canyon. And it could have been great, except she's done a, a real faux pas. She basically said in the diabetes that if everybody will be type 1 diabetes, they would live longer. <laughs> At the time that it was hard to maintain them alive. <laughs> so, okay. But, but, you know, it's not only the insulin signaling, it's the IGF signaling pathway. And, yes. and it was, and, and I'll tell you, I'll jump ahead and tell you 60% of our centenarians have some functional alteration in, uh, in the IGF-1 signaling pathway, 60%. It's wow. the most common genotype. I think it's almost a genotype. It's, it, it might more, not be the only one, but it's really relevant. And it's consistent with the fact that, you know, that the, do the small dogs live longer and the ponies live longer yeah. and those nematodes live longer. And, and, and the barky mice live longer, and, and it was very consistent with that. But this is, uh, just for the story's sake, I, the, the human data, we, we just figured out the human data recently where they had an aging cell paper not long ago where we resolved this issue, but the data that was existing for IGF was very confusing. Some show that IGF is good and some sh show that IGF is bad. IGF is the mm -hmm. insulin growth factor. Insulin growth yeah. factor one is really one of the major effector of the growth hormone system. Okay, just- Yes, yeah. yes. And that, that explicitly makes the connection to the small dogs, large dogs thing. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, so when I wrote my first grant on the IGF system, it's one of the grants that I said, I'm writing it, I can write it, I can justify it. I really don't believe this shit. <laughs> <laughs> but this is actually maybe the only drug, you know, we all write grants and we, 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 we discover important things no matter what, but our hypothesis is usually not right. This was a hypothesis that I didn't believe turned out to be right. Yeah, no, it's 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 an amazing story. Um, 
a little bit more about the sort of methods around studying humans and studying human genetics. I know you, you, most of your work has been in, in animals and in endocrinology, but you're, you're very well known now for these discoveries in, in exceptional longevity. Tell me the story of the Ashkenazi Jews and, and why they are so important to your studies. Yeah, look, uh, it's not only that there are few centenarians, it's also hard to recruit them. And we try to find basically a shortcut. And the shortcut in genetic research is if you have more homogeneous population. So mm-hmm. rather than go in New York City, where there it's one of the most diverse, or the diverse, I think I just read, the, the, the most diverse uh, uh, mm-hmm. in the world, where there are so many genes and so there's so much noise that you have to account, go to a single population. And that time, the single population was the Icelandic population. And they really were having major discoveries, like up to... 10 years ago, they were the population where you had discovered it's only uh, mm-hmm. 500,000 people, but they're yeah. all brothers, cousins, right? Yeah. Um, the other population that was example are the Amish, okay? The Amish mm, population mm, have mm-hmm. 100 founders, so they're also pretty much relative inbred. And so for me, the next population, a population that I'm one of them and I had connection was the the Jewish population and the majority of Americans, American Jews are like more than 90% are Ashkenazi Jews, which means they come from Eastern uh, Europe. And because of an unfortunate history, there's lots of uh, uh, inbreeding and also uh, death, bottlenecks that made this population European, but very homogeneous genetically. We know that because because when you have such a population, some of the rare um, heterozygosities can become homozygous uh, just mm-hmm. because you're the same population. So diseases like Tysax and some hemophilia are more prevalent in, um, in, in Ashkenazi Jews, just to exemplify how unique they are. Now... So genetically, it's homogeneous, and we actually retrospectively went and showed that we would need it's 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 mutation it's gene, it's genotype specific, but yeah. sometimes you need twenty times more people, sometimes fifty times more people to get the same effect. So I had to yeah. recruit, you know, in a <laughs> exponential magnitude more people to get the same effect. So this. This thing has helped a lot. Another is there a, is there a so- social component to this? Uh, you know, in terms of uh, recruitment, for example, and re- then retention. You know, why people why people would stay in your program is 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 that part of this population as well? That's strong. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But the reason is even different. Um, you know, in the United States, most of the Western world, the poor people uh, live fifteen to twenty years less than the rich people, okay? Or I would say differently, I think it's the level of education. Mm -hmm. And the level of education of the Ashkenazi Jews in our study uh, is very homogeneous, okay? Mm. Their income vary, but the education is the same. They all have access to healthcare. So we didn't have to adjust for one of the major factors that are uh, associated with uh, impaired longevity. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, so, so in studying this population, uh, you you find genes. Um, tell me some. I mean, you've hinted at this already. Obviously, the IGF signaling pathway is a strong component. What other individual genes have have come out as being major players? So the major players that come that came out, and I call them major players because they were already translated into therapy. One mm. of them is a a SNP, a, a functional SNP in a gene that's called CTP, cholesterol ester transfer protein. By the way, this gene does not exist in mice and rats <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and in many other animals. But um, when 
this gene is inhibited and you know it has to do with cholesterol ester transfer i don't want to i i don't want to bore anyone although i'm very excited about telling you this but um, but when you inhibit cholesterol ester transfer what happens that you can measure is that hdl cholesterol the good cholesterol goes up Mm-hmm. And triglycerides are going down, okay? It has nothing to do yeah. really with LDL. Yeah. And it was interesting for us, and the reason we looked at this gene is because our families of centenarians had very high HDL level and very low triglycerides. And we okay. found that this functional change in the CTP gene was went from like 8% in our population to 20% in our population. And it was mm. kind of going on it has a linear increase with age. In other words, with the more, age, yes. more people survived, the more of them had this SNP. Now, Merck was interested, the CTP target has also a long history, but Merck was interested in that and developed a drug that went through phase three trial. It's not a drug that they are selling right now. They're looking for some... Uh, opportunities, but uh, the the results of this stu- of their study showed that people um, who took this drug had much lower cholesterol and much less cardiovascular uh, diseases. A phase three trial. Mm. Similarly, we found almost this uh, really the same story in another uh, gene that's called Apo three, Apo C three. Sorry, mm-hmm. and. APOC3 is also kind of a cholesterol gene also associated with low triglycerides and high HDL. Uh, also goes from like 8 to 10% to 18 to 20%. Uh, some, of, some overlap, but that really means that almost 35% of our centenarians have one of those. And there's a company that uh, at the time was called ISIS. They needed to change their name. They're Ionis now. But they also had a, a, a drug and I think they're going to sell that. It's a it's an antisense for the C 3 and the effects were pretty uh, tremendous. So I, I'm just, I think the moral of the story, <laughs> thinking as I told that, is that people say, oh, you're doing genetics. Well, good for you. We don't have these genes. We need gene therapy to do it. No, the genetics mm. is to find mechanism. When you find mechanism, you usually can find a drug. You don't need to do CRISPR. So yep. People are saying, you have to yeah. do CRISPR? No, you don't have to do CRISPR. Well, okay, let's talk about drugs. Um, when do you think we're going to treat people? At what portion of their life would uh, some sort of aging intervention m- most likely to work? Um, can I ask you, are you taking anything? Uh, I, no, I'm just taking exercise. Yeah, well, that's, that's a, we have, we have a geroterapeutics and geroprotector. So you're doing a geroprotector. <laughs> because I'm taking metformin, okay? okay. Hey, but but, but f- frankly, I, I, my doctor put me on metformin because at some stage of my life, I was pre-diabetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not anymore, but I didn't stop metformin, <laughs> and he didn't stop metformin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I'm saying it now. I wasn't proud initially because we're very few doctors. You know, Eric, Eric is one of the doctors Eric in the Verden, field, and yeah. G- Jim Kirkland and Tom mm-hmm. Rando. And and you know, when you're a doctor, you realize that the the first. The first day in medical school, they teach you do no harm, okay? Yeah. So you're very conservative. You really don't want to do anything, okay? Yeah. The The second day, they'll tell you there's no always and there's no never, okay? So you can mm-hmm. give a, a good drug and it'll be bad too, okay? So, mm-hmm. yeah. so yeah. you're confused. You're conservative and confused. And I'm always saying... People at the FDA went only to those two days in medical school because they don't let us <laughs> don't let us move at all. But <laughs> but I, I think I think we have to understand that we really in our evolution of doctors we always were we're just doing a little bit more good than bad and and we got forward with that. But we also killed a lot of people and probably we're still uh, killing people. So 
I, 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 think, I think we have to be conservative and that's why I'm saying um, you have to have clinical trial in mm-hmm, order to mm-hmm. make a judgment. Look, metformin is a drug that's been around so much, billions of use of, years of use, very safe drug. Uh, any doctor can repurpose metformin, okay? It's the right yeah. of every doctor. But if people ask me, is there a proof? I said, no, there is no proof for this study that I'm doing. <laughs> Although yeah. there is a proof to each component of this study, but not the study the way I'm doing it. So I'm very reluctant as carrying this obligation to say, well, I'm taking metformin. But on the other hand, you know, we're getting at the age where we see that it's slow and we know that there's a promise. And what should we do? You know, sacrifice mm-hmm. our aging, our health mm-hmm. span? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 so actually, we did a, a study in, in nematode worms uh, with uh, Patrick Phillips and Monica Driscoll quite recently with metformin. And, you know, you probably remember that Monica published many, many years ago metformin extending lifespan in worms. In this most recent study, we're looking at different strains of wild worms and different species of wild Cenobitis. And we, we saw really diverse effects. And so it, it simply didn't work in some strains and species and maybe was even detrimental in some. And that points obviously to genetic background being really important in the response to drugs. This is probably no surprise to anyone. But it does get to this question about how do you, how, ahead of a clinical trial, how do you actually structure it? Is, is there a way to, to, to find a, a, a subgroup of people who will respond to the drug in aging and, and those that would not? I mean, that would be fantastic to know, right? Because if we just take a random population, we may not see the effect size it would like to see. Right. But, but look, our preliminary data that is very substantial. Okay, so I'll give you two examples. The study that's known as the DPP, Diabetes Prevention Program, took people... Uh, who were normal glycemic, but had, um, had, you know, risk for diabetes. So obesity, mm-hmm. family members took risk, but they were important to know. They were not diabetic. And gave them either metformin or lifestyle changes that in- include exercise and diet. And it was a five-year study, but it was uh, stopped after four years because both lifestyle and metformin significantly prevented diabetes, so delayed yes. delayed diabetes. And the effect was 30%, okay? Wow. So you're asking, well, why, why it's not 100%? But most of the drugs, you know, like the cholesterol-lowering agents that are really considered good, have 20% mm-hmm. effect in a population. By the way, it's 20% over the observed years, okay? Yes. Okay, so... Okay, but basically, when you have an effect that is over 10, 10 percent, it's a, it's not a pri- it's not a private event. It's a very common event. Okay, you can say that at this period that most of the people are going to benefit from metformin. Yeah, and, yeah. and the eff- and and the effect, you know, the number of people that we chose for this study was based on the DPP, even the amount of drugs we're taking is based on the DPP. Similarly, there was a a UK study, it was called UK PDS, where metformin was in diabetes was compared to other three classes, uh, one class of drug by three drugs that are called sulfonylurea and insulin. And only Mm. metformin significantly decreased cardiovascular disease. And I can yeah. go on, on on more and more studies. It's all, It was also a 30% effect. If you look, not at clinical study, but if you look at 250 studies about cancer and metformin use, it's a 30% effect for all cancer except prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when you have a 30% uh, effect over an observed years, this is a public uh, player. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and 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 you know and then there's the side effect because 180,000 people in UK that were studied with you know those without diabetes those with diabetes on sulfonylurea and metformin 
people who took metformin who were diabetic, more obese, and had more disease to start with, had lower mortality over five years than people without diabetes. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Which, by the way, it's, you know, when Rich Miller says, hey, you know, I don't get ITP metformin or the effect of metformin are low, and it has to do also with your nematode. Yeah, that, that's, that's in mice, and that's, mm -hmm. that's with the dose that you give them, that was, there's yes. a dose response, okay? Yes. But we already know in humans that the effect is greater, even, mm -hmm. even compared to normal. Look, metformin versus sulfonylurea in humans is, is 50% uh, uh, less mortality. And from non-diabetic, it's 17%. So it's more than Rich Miller's already yeah, in a yeah. statistical. So <laughs> some of those drugs, I, and I think, look, we can expect that maybe rapamycin, maybe metformin is better in humans and rapamycin is less than mm -hmm. what we thought mm -hmm. from animals. It, it could be, you know, but that's... Yeah, no, it makes, makes perfect sense. makes perfect sense. Um, do you think that... Uh, how, how, how do you see biomarkers playing out here? Because maybe we can improve even these numbers by appropriate dosing, um, and, and maybe that's a response to... Uh, the drug that we can track with biomarkers, whether it be epigenetic or protein or other others? Do you think that's likely? So remember the biomarkers are not interesting only to distinguish between biological and chronological age. We want them to change with therapy, okay? We, want, mm -hmm. we don't want to do a phase three trial for 100 drugs and spend trillions of dollars on them, right? We want in two months on a phase two study to see, are the biomarkers changing? Okay, that's our yes, challenge. Yes, yes, yes. And I picked actually proteins as the most likely biomarkers. Also listening to Harvard who said, look, you're not going to change, to change methylation in nine months or even more than a year of treatment. And we measured 5,000 proteins by Aftermir on thousand of our people in the longevity study, half offspring and half uh, control. And we ask what's changing between ages 65 and 95. And there are many proteins, but the ones that are really incredible to me are break proteins that show breakdown. For example, a collagen, extra, extracellular metrics, mm -hmm. um, even degranulation of platelets or breakdown of, uh, of, of some, some cells because I think that it's the breakdown that we want to stop. We can stop it by many treatments, but it's that what we want to stop. So yes. we, we now had actually an, a conference in the NIH supported by Mayo and AFAR and other uh, people and I brought in some ideas that we're going to accelerate because there are some, the, the DPP, for example, that I, I told you about, mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. have samples where we can actually look at the effect of both lifestyle intervention and metformin by yeah. omics. Do omics of everything, proteomics, metabolomics, very, you know, uh, 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 methylation, whatever, yeah. and really try and see what happens in those studies. Also, there's another drug, SGLT2, that I think is really a very important gerotherapeutic in humans. You give it to diabetes, but you prevent heart disease, you prevent kidney disease, you prevent all mm -hmm. cause of mortality. ITP has showed that it, uh, that it uh, elongates lifespan of, uh, of, of uh, Rich Miller's mice. Yeah. So, so I think that's the way to go fast. Very promising. Very promising. I mean, they, they, we've seen recently in mice with Brian Kennedy's lab that we actually can see a compression of morbidity in, in this case with a metabolite. That, that's what's going on with, with, with these human results, right? You're really reducing the period of sickness and, and that, that has an enormous uh, social and, and economic effect down the line. Uh, Nir, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I've learned a lot, and, and thank you for your, your public outreach and your advocacy at the FDA and other places for this field, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Me too. Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, share, 
and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We're not getting any younger, yet, is made possible by a generous grant from the Navigage Foundation. The Navigage Foundation is enhancing the lives of older people through the support of housing, health education, and human services. Our podcast is produced by Vital Mind Media. Wellington Bowler is here with me, using sign language to keep me on course and recording the podcast. Stella, who I love spending time with talking about science, as you know, is our editor. With the creative direction of Sharif Izzat and the Buck Institute's very own Robin Snyder as the executive producer. If you are listening to this podcast, you know that there's never been a more exciting time in research on ageing. Discoveries from our labs are moving into the clinic to help us all live better, longer. The Buck Institute depends on the support of people like you to carry on our breakthrough research. Please visit us at buckinstitute.org to donate and to learn more.